Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. And our guest tonight has come from another country, not the farthest one in the world, but he's from another country, our great neighbor to the north, Canada. And he has been following the life and the work of Venerable Fulton J. Sheen for many years. He is the founder and the director of the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Mission Society of Canada and has served on the Board of Trustees of the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Foundation in Peoria, Illinois. And we'll ask him about why he's messing around with Peoria, because that's important. In addition to being the creator of the website bishopsheentoday.com, he is the editor of a best-selling book called The Cries of Jesus from the Cross, a Fulton Sheen anthology. So please welcome Mr. Alan Smith. Alan, welcome. Thank you. Thank Good you. to have you. I uh, am very, very happy to, to have you here. I am a big fan of Archbishop Sheen myself, and I really like your book, uh, The Cries of Jesus from the Cross. It's, I've been using it for my own Lenten meditations. Let's, let's first of all set things up here. Uh, who was Archbishop Sheen, and why do you bother to study him? Well, um, again, you look at trusted names. You could read a number of saints. You could read a number of uh, great history books. But when you really study who do you trust, I think Archbishop Sheen is a trusted name. Mm -hmm. I think of the generations, my father, my grandfather, aunts, you mean uncles. the people my age? Your age, <laughs> yeah. How they spoke so fondly of him. And, yeah. um, and I hear of the numbers of converts to the faith, of how he brought not tens of thousands of souls, but I think hundreds of thousands of souls uh, to the Lord and his church. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, these numbers alone are staggering. Yeah. So there's something to be said about the man. And uh, again, his writings are, are just touching hearts still today. And I think for myself, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I say to everyone, read Sheen, read Sheen. If you're looking mm -hmm. for answer to today's tough questions, read him. He has these answers. Because he wasn't afraid to tackle the issues of the day, mm -mm. which uh, haven't changed. Yeah. S sin is still sin. We still broadcast his programs from the 1950s, and they remain relevant because many of the same problems still exist because folks keep on trying the same dumb solutions they were trying back in the 50s. And what's amazing is just as in the 50s, they think it's a new solution. Let's try communism or socialism and let's see how that works. And he was dealing with that way back in the 20s. Now, when, first of all, when did he start doing work in the media? Yeah, I think, uh, well, he was asked to, of course, in 1926. I remember they asked him to do some Lenten reflections on the radio. And uh, so he started to appear on the radio. And uh, again, in 1930, he was asked uh, to um, be the host of the Catholic Hour. And uh, from what I've read, he was just supposed to be a fill-in in 1930, uh, just for a couple weeks, but they liked him so much, uh, all of a sudden he stayed for 20 years and he was the mm -hmm. voice of the Catholic Hour. And, and, and to, for folks to get some perspective, the longest running radio show in the world is the Grand Ole Opry show. I think that's still the longest one mm -hmm. uh, on uh, radio. But he was doing his first broadcast before that, mm -hmm. wasn't continuous, but he's, and that's really early in radio history is my point. Right, and uh, again, that trusted name, think of a 20 year run. How many people have a, a, are called back? I think people ask about their longevity, and yet he was that trusted soul, and mm -hmm. uh, 
I tell you, the church needed him, and they wanted mm -hmm. to hear his wisdom. And he was speaking not just to Catholics. Uh, he was speaking to everyone. That's one of the very important things, too, um, because um, maybe close to your dad's age, not older, and uh, I certainly grew up watching his shows on TV. I was pretty young, so I didn't understand everything. But my mom, you know, certainly was right there watching that. Uh, and it, it, one of the things that's also interesting about Archbishop Sheen, the show that was on the other channel, there are only three channels in those days. Number one show was on a different network, and that was the Milton Berle show. And Sheen knocked Milton Berle out of the, the, the running. Burl was called Mr. Television. That was his nickname. Mm -hmm. And Sheen undid him, to, much to his bafflement. Yeah. You know, so he, this is quite, yeah. quite amazing what he's able to do. The joke was always, and Milton Burl said this, oh, he has better writers than me. Yeah, better right, writers. Right. And there's Matthew, there's Mark, Luke, Luke and John. John. Yeah. <laughs> his famous acceptance speech when he won the Emmy yeah. uh, for the Outstanding Personality on Television. You know, I want to thank my writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So. And he, would, he also said that joke was so funny, even Milton Berle dropped his pencil from trying to copy it <laughs> yeah, from somebody that's else. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it's, you know, this shows a real uh, uh, amazing quality that he had. Mm -hmm. And he, used to, he said in his talks he would spend an hour meditating for each minute that he was on the air. Yeah. And it showed, it mm -hmm. showed. Uh, the preparation he did, not just for his television shows, but his lectures at the university. Uh, Sheen was known as a great retreat master, yes. uh, a great speaker, and that takes preparation. Anybody that's given retreats know it's not something you just wing it. You have to prepare and prepare. And I think of Fulton Sheen and his life of his holy hour, his Eucharistic adoration, always on the Catholic hour, and not just the Catholic hour, but all the time, he would talk about giving an hour of your life, making a holy hour. At the end of every radio broadcast, he would say, and I challenge everyone to make a holy hour. If you have to do a half hour before Mass, and then another half hour later, but make the holy hour. And he would challenge not just Catholics, but Protestants too, to just set an hour a day for the Lord. But especially as Catholics, well, of course, you can adore the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And so again, this time of this conversation with the Lord, uh, we always think of those, that great scripture, speak Lord, your servant's listening. Sometimes I think when we go to adoration, we say, listen Lord, your servant's speaking. Yeah. But uh, you know, with Bishop Sheen, you knew he was having a conversation with our Lord and getting his notes, his instructions. That's one of the things that it, when I read your book, you know, it's, it's called The Cries of Jesus from the Cross. And this is actually a collection of short essays and sermons, things that he had spoken that were written down um, and essays. It's a collection of these on each of the seven word, last words of Christ from the Cross. First of all, why did you choose that topic? Let, let's go into that. Right, yeah. I, I wanted to leave something behind where you think of one of the greatest sermons ever preached was from Calvary. Uh, the seven last words is one of the greatest sermons. And I think sometimes we don't think of it as a sermon. We think of the Beatitudes as the Sermon on the Mount. But do we ever think of the seven last words as a sermon? Mm -hmm. But it truly was the sermon of a dying man, mm -hmm. our Lord from the cross, uh, sharing with us his words. And uh, so this homily from Calvary, these seven last words, what is contained in these words, I think really unravels the mystery of life. It mm -hmm. gives us a catechesis to follow, uh, to just ponder. I think if you think of those words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And just ponder that for a few moments. This day you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those beautiful words, I thirst. You just 
think of how there is almost, a, I want to say, a catechesis. I think of Mother Teresa especially. She built a whole ministry or a, um, a, I want to say a, a whole religious order on I thirst. If you go into any of her uh, chapels, you'll always see the tabernacle and then a picture of our Lord with the words I thirst. Um, you think of it is finished. And of course, our Lord, his last words was, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. There is great wisdom, mercy in those words. And I don't think we spend enough time on those words. A lot of times it's just on Good Friday. We read the Passion narrative. And that's the last we'll ponder about our Lord's seven last words. And I think Sheen wanted to bring that to our attention, not just at Lent, not just on Good Friday, not just during you know, Easter, but throughout the year. And uh, again, he wrote many books. Uh, when you start to look at the body of his work, you start to realize he wrote a great deal on the seven last <coughs> words and mm -hmm. the passion. And that's what's in this anthology. These are, uh, there's eight books that Sheen wrote with various themes. Uh, he was taught uh, at the Catholic, um, when he went to Louvain University, uh, one of his professors, Cardinal Mercier, said, I want you to rip up your notes every year. Try to always give a fresh, uh, lesson. Uh, don't try to repeat yourself. And I think many people know, they say, oh, Father's doing the same homily he gave last year or the year before. But Sheen always gave a fresh presentation, especially on the seven last words. When I look at the body of his work, I'll give you a few examples. So in 1936, he gave seven reflections over the season of Lent on, and it was called Calvary and the Mass. And so he looked at the seven last words, and he applied seven parts of the Mass to each and every one of those words. So for example, the words, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, is the confidior, where we ask for mercy. The words, um, this day you'll be with me in paradise, is the offertory. Of course, with the Blessed Mother, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. That's the holy, 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 or the sanctus. You think of the consecration as my God, my God. You think of the communion as being I thirst. Um, and then you think of that, uh, my Latin is not always the best, but it is finished, ita misa est. Mm -hmm. And of course, the last gospel is, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And so you see, oh, those match. And for, those for some folks who don't realize that in the liturgy back in those days, we always read the first chapter of John, uh, verses 1 through 18, before uh, we left. So it was called the last gospel, and that's right. what, what he referred to there. Yeah. So Sheen is on the radio, and every year he's trying to keep it fresh and new. And uh, so in 1935, his Good Friday address was on the Our Father and the Seven Last Words. And then in 1936, his address was on the Mass and the Seven Last Words. And then in 1937, he gave uh, the address on the Seven Beatitudes and the Seven Last Words. And that book turned out to be The Cross and the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, beautiful, again, if you, and again, I could spend hours here, but uh, uh, he took seven Beatitudes and matched them again to the Seven Last Words, like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, he said. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, showing that our Lord was meek. He then continues with, um, this day you'll be with me in paradise, and he says, now I'm of course going to have some stage fright here <laughs> and forget, uh, but uh, again, it's these, um, and I apologize for that, but uh, you can't memorize them all. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the third word, he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And of course, of course, woman, behold your son who is absolute purity because she comes from purity, which is the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but again, these beautiful beatitudes and linking the seven last words. Mm -hmm. And he, again, he did it again. And then the following year, he did a, a presentation called The Rainbow of Sorrows, where he talked about seven different uh, unjust suffering, pain, uh, the suffering of the innocent. And he tied them beautifully into the seven last words. And then the following year, he did a reflection on the seven deadly sins. 
and how the seven last words were the antidote for those sins. It's actually my favorite book uh, that he mm -hmm. wrote uh, mm -hmm. called Victory Over Vice. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, if you just think and ponder the sin of anger, many of our viewers struggle with anger. And yet, he says, our Lord preached forgiveness, preached mercy, and on the, f on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So again, what a great remedy for the sin of anger. Uh, for the sin of envy, he plays out the, um, the mystery happening between the two thieves. One of the thieves was asking to be taken up, and the other was asking to be taken down. Now the bad thief was saying, if I had the power you had, Lord, I would ask Lee to smite my enemies, and let's get down from the cross. He was asking for the wrong thing. But the good thief had no envy in him. He saw the Lord, he realized the Lord was forgiving his enemies, and he looked to him and said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom, to which he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. There was no envy in the good thief. There was no envy at all. Mm -hmm. We look to the sins of impurity and how people, it seems society has gone crazy, yet he presents that higher love of our blessed mother. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, what a great, I always think of her as a protective custody. Can you imagine if we took her into our home uh, and she watched TV with us every day? You know, we'd be watching EWTN all the time. We wouldn't <laughs> be watching the other stuff. But uh, she is really that beautiful remedy for, for purity. And you look who's beside her at the foot of the cross. It's Magdalene, you know, a reformed prostitute. So, again, she presents those words, woman behold your son, son behold your mother, as... Uh, something to take into consideration. The sins of pride, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where he uh, looks towards the intellectual pride, the social pride. Uh, pride is just a killer in society today. And uh, Sheen really, um, you know, he, 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 he didn't waste words. I always remember, he'd always say, why are you so proud? And he'd use this example, he'd say, chemically, chemically, you're only, I look at you, you know, there's enough iron in your body to make one nail. Uh, there's enough oil in your body to make seven bars of soap. Uh, there's enough uh, phosphorus to make 2,000 matches. So chemically, you're worth about $2. But your soul is worth everything. It's, it's worth everything. Mm -hmm. And why are you so proud? And so he would really uh, bring us to our senses um, that way. You know, and again, we continue with these seven deadly sins. You think of the sin of gluttony. Uh, when our Lord says, I thirst. And, uh, you know, what, what, who is our God? What are we thirsting for? Sports, entertainment, food. And yet he makes reparation. He's thirsting for that relationship with us. And uh, so he really provides a great um, remedy to us to say, who am I thirsting for? He wants a relationship with us. One of the things that your reflections bring out, and again, especially when... I read these different essays by Archbishop Sheen is that it demonstrates what we said before, that he spent uh, at least an hour a day in a holy hour. Mm -hmm. He prayed very deeply over everything. And the fruit of that prayer shows itself in his insights things that ju there's no superficiality about mm. the insights that he has. These are very profound. They're clear. They're, they're not obscure. It's not too hard to get. Uh, as I like to say, he knows how to bring the hay down so the goats can get it. Mm. You know, this is very clear and simple language, but it is profound and uh, the, the connections that he makes. And that can only happen because he himself had suffered, but also he took all of that to his prayer. And it, it just comes out. Now, I just love reading through all these different mm -hmm. essays and using them in my prayer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on a personal note, uh, Bishop Sheen had a five-foot-tall crucifix at the foot of his bed. And so every morning he woke up, he saw the Lord, he saw the crucifix. And of course, going to bed, he saw the crucifix again. So think about what that did for him. 
to continue to ponder and to look upon the crucifix. And I think of all the pictures of the saints. You see those pictures, they're, they're looking at the crucifix, gazing and pondering. There's something to be learned there. So not only was he communicating with our Lord through Eucharistic adoration, he was also communicating with our Lord by looking at the crucifix. Mm -hmm. And Archbishop Sheen said, you know, you can have a statue of a Buddha, you can have a picture of Niagara Falls, but you put a crucifix on your desk for three days and it'll change you. It'll change you mm -hmm. because it involves you. You can't help but look at the crucifix and say, I had something to do with that. Mm -hmm. My sins put our Lord on the cross. And conversely, when in our churches, they began to remove crucifixes as a fad back in the 70s. It also changed the churches so that people became chatty inside mass and the, because oftentimes the Blessed Sacrament was also removed. Mm -hmm. um, that removal of the crucifix and removal of the Blessed Sacrament, Christ in the, in the Blessed Sacrament, changed churches and people's attitude toward Mass for the worse mm -hmm. and made the Mass more superficial and people stopped coming. Right. I think that, you know, the, the need to understand that we come there for Jesus. Uh, some, of the, <laughs> some of the liturgists would say that, well, the, the presence of the Blessed Sacrament is a distraction at Mass. And I responded to one who said this, said, well, exactly who is the main attraction here then? You think it's the priest or the choir or the servers? I, Jesus needs to be the main focus and attraction at Holy Mass. This is uh, essential. Right. And, and Sheen understood that with absolute clarity. Right. Everything, the best description I ever heard of a priest, you know, when people say, what is a priest? It is a priest is someone who brings Jesus to the people and then helps bring the people to Jesus. And that's what Sheen did. Yes. He brought Jesus to the people and he brought literally millions of people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think of his love for scripture. I was, mm -hmm. um, when I compiled the anthology and I had finally put the final touches on it, I counted up the number of scripture passages in this book mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there was 440 of them. Mm -hmm. So Sheen has got <coughs> scripture after scripture mm -hmm. after scripture and I think this is why he was revered. He kept pointing to the scriptures, kept pointing to the life of Christ. Yes. And I think that's why all the faiths embraced him. In fact, in his wonderful book, uh, The Life of Christ, he's got a, uh, it's not something you did, uh, one of his own books, but his, The Life of Christ that he wrote is just that. It's loaded with scripture and brilliant insight into the passages of the Bible because he knew that the Bible is not a philosophy book. He's, he's talked about that mm -hmm. in his course on how to come into the church. Um, the truth will set you free. And in there he said that philosophy asks, where is God? And the Bible asks uh, or shows that God is asking, where is man? Mm -hmm. And that this is God speaking to us was always Sheen's understanding of sacred scripture. Right, yeah. But again, this idea of he wanted to point to Christ. Yes. And so when he would talk about the seven last words, be it through the Beatitudes, the seven deadly sins, he wrote a book on virtue. And uh, we need to practice virtue. And one of the books contained in the anthology is the seven words of Jesus and Mary. And that's one of the most beautiful books of all, where he talks about the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another love of Sheen. Is that Sheen. the first, world's first love? No, this was the seven words of Jesus and Mary, where oh. he took the seven last words, and then he, 
Our Lady spoke seven times in sacred scripture, and he linked all of those. So the first words, for example, our Lord says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Our Lady, in her first words, the angel appears to her, says she's going to conceive the Savior, and she says, how can this be? Because I know not man. She know, know not. And our Lord said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. So this beauty of not knowing, the, the value of ignorance. And uh, she always would say, uh, she would say, I should say, uh, you know, there's something about not knowing. How so many people would say, I wish I never had my first drink. I wish I'd never met that person. I wish I'd never stole my first dollar. And if I could just have a university of unlearning, I wish I could just unlearn this. Well, that's, that's a, at the very core of the serpent's temptation in Eden. You know, God knows that once you taste it, you will have the same knowledge he has. Satan tempts us to have experiential knowledge of sin. That's what he wants us to do. And when somebody says to you, well, say like trying drugs or something, well, how do you know you won't like it unless you try it? Mm -hmm. You ought to be listening for a hiss from the serpent. Yes. You know, that's yes. close by. Yeah. She would say, you know, uh, we're the most educated <laughs> group of people. But uh, again, it hasn't made us any better. Uh, there is this beauty in not knowing. And again, I love that university of unlearning. Uh, you know, a lot of us have our alma maters that we're proud of, but this university of unlearning, every Catholic can go to this university, and it's called the confessional. Mm -hmm. And uh, you go to that university, and of course you come out uh, as, you know, clean like a lamb. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheen would write, he says, it's easier for me to, to write on blank parchment, clean parchment, than uh, something with a lot of scribbles on it. And so, again, there's the beauty of not knowing. I think we need to uh, practice that a bit more. And that came from Our Lady and her first words. But it also comes from Sheen's insight as an extremely intelligent and very highly educated man who was w educated enough to know how limited education really is. Because mm -hmm. as one of my friends often says, uh, there are some people who are educated far beyond their intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Sheen wrote about uh, the intelligentsia, and uh, one yeah, of the books that he wrote, <laughs> it's, uh, he talked about the seven groups that resist the cross, and uh, they're, they're the groups that we know today, um, the humanist, uh, the moderns, uh, the selfish, the intelligentsia, uh, the sensationalist that want a religion that's uh, flashy, the thinkers. Uh, there's so, these groups, and again, that's... Uh, he, he wasn't afraid to say these people were at the foot of the cross and they're still here in society today and they're representatives. So uh, again, he was always just asking us to beware, not to be, become a modern, not to be a humanist that wants a cross but without a crucifix, that wants a, a religion, that wants a brotherhood of religion but not uh, with sacrifice. So, uh, and you know, the moderation, he always talks about the mediocre survives. Uh, we're not passionate about anything anymore because uh, the mediocre will survive, but those who are too holy get crucified. Those who are too evil get killed too. So uh, there's something about uh, our Lord says, of course, the scriptures. Uh, he doesn't want, you know, hot or cold. He'll sp lukewarm. He'll spit out. So yeah, that's, that's not good either. No. Getting spit out of God's mouth. No, you don't want that. No, not at all. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so again, Sheen was always warning us. He wasn't afraid to warn us and just say it like it is. I, I remember in 1939, he said, there's more health clubs uh, than spiritual retreat houses in this country. And yet, everybody wants to exercise for two hours a day. But if I ask you to spend five minutes on your knees, oh, that's too long, that's too long. Again, he was brutally honest, yet very refreshing. We needed to hear that. Probably still the same. There are more people on those exercise machines than there are at the uh, Eucharistic Adoration. Right. Yes. We need to take a little break. We're going to come back in a couple of minutes. We want to get some of your questions about Archbishop Sheen, his writings, and his words about Christ's seven last words, as well as comments from our audience. So please stay with us.
right. Are you ready for some questions and I'm comments? Ready. Yes. Come on, let's giddy up. Uh, Ma'am, where are you from? North Carolina. North Carolina. Yes. Good to have you here. Thank what you. is your question? I was wondering if you could talk about the process of canonization and what's going on with that with Bishop Sheen. Well, I think that's a great question because Archbishop Sheen is now venerable. Right. What does that mean? Okay. Uh, venerable means, I always say, worthy of imitation. Um, you think of the word venerate. Um, for what I understand is that when you look at the cause of a saint and the process that's involved, um, a, a canonization, it starts from the very beginning where um, a diocese, for example, say the Diocese of Peoria, uh, petitions Rome and opens a cause. And, and that was Archbishop Sheen's yeah, yeah. home diocese. That's right. And so in 2002, that's when the cause began. And then what happens is data is collected, testimonies, uh, almost everything they could do, a positio is written, and it's presented to the Vatican. So they're constantly sending information to the Vatican to build a case, uh, because you're really trying to say to the cause of the saints that uh, department in the Vatican, our man was worthy. And uh, so the Vatican, of course, um, looks over everything. Yeah, every single known writing. Yes. Or in the case of Archbishop Sheen, also what he broadcast. Mm -hmm. You know, all of that has to be looked at okay. to make sure there's no uh, uh, willful error. Okay. I remember seeing pictures of cases of uh, books and documents going over to the Vatican. And uh, of course, that was read by theologians and processed. And uh, then uh, in 2012, that's when uh, Pope Benedict XVI declared Bishop Sheen, uh, Archbishop Sheen, venerable. And so after that process, then the Vatican says, okay, well, we're ready for miracles if you have some miracles to present. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the case of Fulton Sheen, there was, there's been miracles. And so the miracle that they presented was of the a young boy who was, um, I want to say, dead for 61 minutes and uh, no pulse, no sign of life. And uh, the doctor was about to write a death certificate and that child came back to life. And uh, of course, uh, they studied the medical documents and it was, you know, deemed a miracle. And so uh, that miracle was approved. And uh, so again, the process continues. Theologians then approve the cause. And uh, then, you know, the process continues. And um, I think people have been following, of course, the, uh, this case closely. Uh, but, you know, I don't have an official position because I'm not, I serve my term on the board of directors. Mm -hmm. And um, I have an opinion, uh, but it's not the position of Peoria. Right. And uh, they always say, I always say it takes time for the church to discern. Um, this. Um, war over remains has happened. I'm not a historian, you are Father Mitch, and you can always tell stories of, we look into Europe of how uh, bodies were sought after, and mm -hmm. I think they used to break into churches, <laughs> not that they would break into uh, a Catholic church in America to uh, do that, but yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's just one of these things, it's gonna take time. I mean, we've been spoiled by Mother Teresa, John Paul II, these quick um, causes, but, um, There'll always be opinions, and I'm sure that mm -hmm. uh, each diocese has its own opinion. But everything seems to point that it makes sense to uh, have Fulton Sheen's remains go to Peoria. I look at his history, ordained as a priest in Peoria, and uh, then he was on loan to the Catholic University of America as a priest from Peoria. And so he, the majority of his priestly life was through Peoria, mm -hmm. and he used to visit, come home every year. Uh, he had those famous years in New York where, of course, television. Sure. But his roots are Peoria. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it, makes no, uh, it makes sense, of sure. course. You think of saints, they always come home. Yeah. And it's just right that he would come home. And come, it, come on, plus the, uh, the, the Bishop uh, Jenke of Peoria had started the cause, yes. you know, uh, first. And so yeah. the, just, yeah. it's a matter of we just want to see it finished. Yeah. What I understand is that the cause was offered to New York uh, a couple of times and they turned it down. It was offered to Rochester, or at least they petitioned and they asked uh, a number of people uh, to say, would you like to take this cause? And so 
Uh, at the time, they had said no. And uh, so Rochester turned it down and New York turned it down. But Bishop Jenke of Peoria embraced it and said, love to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we'd love to have some good news in the future. Yeah. And so let's pray. Yeah, we'll just keep we'll praying. Pray and, yeah. and God willing, that uh, it, it's, I don't care. I don't have a dog in that race. No. But what we want to do is make sure that this, uh, the, the canonization yeah. proceeds. And, and, and I know that Peoria would, uh, churches would request relics and uh, they sure. would gladly yeah, uh, yeah. do that. That was always the intention was to say that we want to share him with the world yeah. and to not just keep him in one spot. Sharing is good. It's My good. mom said to share. Yes. I'm sure the Blessed yeah. Mother would yes. too. Absolutely. All right, let's go over to George. George, where are you calling from? Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Great. Welcome. And what is your question or comment? I have a comment. Uh, I'm a longtime pro-life activist, and, and something that I'll never forget Bishop Sheen having said, he said that the first tabernacle was the womb of our Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that. I think it's a very pro-life thing to say. Yep. Yeah. Any comments on that? Well, I just... You know, I think of that, it's so true that uh, she brought the Lord and I think of the uh, visitation to uh, Mary to her cousin Elizabeth and of course uh, the reaction of St. John uh, in the womb. Um, uh, but again, it is, uh, again, this tabernacle theme that Sheen has always put her eyes towards the Lord. The Lord was in Our Lady and the Lord is in the tabernacle. So um, again, there's that dual meaning or that dual purpose uh, but again, Sheen said some beautiful things over the years that uh, I just find, I, I even said it in the book, in the introduction, there's going to be lines that you're going to read in the book that you're just going to have to stop and ponder. And this line that this gentleman just shared is one of those lines. Mm -hmm. You just have to ponder it for minutes and minutes and sometimes days, it seems. So. George, I don't know if you're aware of this or if you are, but if you ever get a chance to go to the Holy Land, there is a town just a few miles west of Jerusalem, you know, I don't think it's even 10 miles, called Kiryat Ye'arim. At Kiryat Ye'arim is the threshing floor in which the Ark of the Covenant had been placed. And a nun had a vision of the Lord appeared to her telling her to go to that place and build the church. And she found, in fact, that there were the ruins of a Byzantine church on that same place from the fourth century. So she built the church. The name of it is Our Lady of the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. the, so it's a whole church dedicated to that notion. And this is before Bishop Sheen. This goes back, well, four centuries, well before he, yeah. he was around, but also the sister built that in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, and so that it's, it's a fabulously, uh, it's not a really beautiful, most beautiful church in the country, but it'd be a good one to go and maybe uh, to, to pray there for the pro-life movement. Yeah. And I, I think we've, some people forget that Bishop Sheen composed that beautiful spiritual ado adoption prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we see it at all the pro-life marches, there are prayer cards that have been made up where we spiritually adopt a child. And Sh Sheen penned that prayer 30 years before Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. He had the, uh, I, said, I wanna say the insight to compose that prayer and just to share it. And uh, again, it's the, one of the most famous pro-life prayers yes. that uh, there. So again, that was f through the pen of Fulton Sheen. So. I have another caller. Hello, Mary Ann. Hi, Father Paco. How are you? Fine, thanks. This is a lady from New York. What can yeah, we do for you today? Um, just a quick question. I just want to get uh, your, your opinion, your guest's opinion. Um, you know, Father uh, Fulton J. Sheen was such an enormous um, influence. Uh, and he was such an amazing person in preaching the message of our Lord. And I'm just curious, how well do you think in the environment that we live today, if there were another Fulton J. Sheehan, or if he were here now, or another Fulton J. Sheehan, how well would he be received, and how much does our culture now affect 
um, the message that uh, Fulton J. Sheen preached and uh, to, for us to live a good and holy life. Thank you, and God bless you both. Thank you, Marianne. Mm. Well, Sheen preached the gospel in season and out of season. So if you can do that today, you're the next Bishop Sheen. And uh, again, we, the media is, is looking for the next Fulton Sheen. There's always, who's the next one? Uh, is it yourself? Is it uh, Bishop Robert Barron? You know, it's, uh, there's all these names that are thrown around. Uh, but if you preach Christ and him crucified, you'll be pretty popular. But uh, there's so many choices now. This is what's difficult. I think back in the day of Sheen, you know, there was only three television stations, only a few radio stations. Uh, so his numbers were great. But today it's very competitive, very difficult uh, with all the different forms of media, with uh, social media, of course, TV. There's lots there. But uh, again, if someone's brave enough to preach Christ and him crucified, uh, it's not the prosperity gospel. It's preaching Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll do well. Let's Absolutely. We have another caller. Hello, Rusty. Yes. Where are you calling from? Michigan. Where in Michigan? Oh, uh, near Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I found out that way. So yeah. what is your question? Um, years ago, my mother listened all the time, and I was younger, but I remember that she so wanted to get the book on tolerance that Bishop Sheen wrote, because it seemed so crazy that he was saying tolerance was going to be our undoing in our nation. But now, if you think of all the tolerant, that we're so tolerant of everything, that it makes sense now. And I wondered if he knew which book that was. All right. Uh, that was from his radio addresses on the Catholic Hour, and that has been republished. There is a book under that title, uh, I think, about tolerance. So, um, again, I'm not up on all 66 titles, but I know that was from his radio, his Catholic Hour addresses uh, from the 40s, and uh, we're seeing a lot of those of them republished now. But I just saw it recently, so it is out there. Um, a lot of Sheen's works are still haven't been republished yet, uh, but that one I know is out. And so, again, I can't give you the publisher's name, uh, but I have seen it, so there is hope. You, you may want to go um, online, uh, Rusty, and type in Fulton Sheen and Tolerance, and you'll probably find that title will come up. Yeah. One thing, uh, just not to uh, talk about the book too much, <laughs> I mean, we're here to talk, but in this anthology, the seven books that are there, there's three books that haven't been seen in 80 years, mm -hmm. and so that was very important. People wanted to uh, be reintroduced to Sheen. Yes. Uh, and I was always surprised just that people haven't republished a lot of his books mm -hmm. because he was making a new book every year. And so while he was alive, you didn't want his old to republish his old books because you knew he was going to have a new edition uh, come out. And it was like every year, 1972, 73. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of these were sitting there with no one even looking at them. Mm -hmm. So three of the seven books in this anthology haven't been seen in 80 years. The 1938 book uh, called The Rainbow of Sorrows, the 1940 book, The Seven Virtues, and the 1944 book, The Seven Words to the Cross. So for those people who love to be uh, collectors and reminisce about the old writings, uh, it's in there, it's in the anthology. Oh, let's go to Jean. Jean, where are you calling from? Uh, Ashburn, Virginia, Father. Wonderful, wonderful. What's your question or comment? My question is, was Bishop Sheen for the modernization of the Second Ecumenical Council? The modernization right, so what, the was Bishop Sheen in favor of Vatican II and the modernization that took place? Yeah. Uh, the only comment I could make is that, I mean, Sheen was very enthusiastic. He attended everything from 1962 to 1965. So he, and that's one of the points, Gene, Archbishop Sheen was at the council. Yes, and attended all the sessions and participated uh, a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, speaking to modernism, I can't, I don't really know what his, uh, you know, what his opinion was, what he wrote down, 
but uh, maybe, of course, you being a priest, you might be able to answer yeah, that question better. I could say a couple things. Sure. One, uh, he spoke very favorably of the council yes. and its process. And he said, um, when they took vote, well, he said, when we took the votes, there were only five voices that uh, voted no on everything because they didn't want there to be a council. Right. But everybody else of the nearly 2,000 bishops there, we all, we all voted for it. So uh, he w was uh, enthusiastic about the process because it was something that was carefully worked through. They, they met uh, uh, quite a bit to go through the different issues. And he uh, uh, was very much in favor of uh, mass in, in English. He didn't mind that. But he also knew the difference from what the council said and what people were saying that the council said, usually under the guise. Well, in the spirit of Vatican II, as soon as somebody talks about the spirit of Vatican II, he would be, and it, he addressed that, mm -hmm. that he knew what the Vatican Council actually said. And the, the spirit of the council, as they called it, was usually something that contradicted the actual words of the con council. Mm -hmm. That would make him angry. Yes. He did not have any tolerance for liturgical abuse and uh, a lot of the things going on in architecture and all the rest in the church. Mm -hmm. That he had no tolerance for. And disrespect for the Eucharist, disregard mm -hmm. for the Mass as a sacrifice, he was flat against that. But he liked what he saw in the council. Yes. And uh, that, that was very, very clear. Right. And I know that he spent uh, the last 10 years of his life spending a lot of time with priests. Uh, yes. You know, when he retired as the Bishop of Rochester, uh, he could have just easily retired and taken a break and gone to Hawaii, but he rolled up his sleeves and gave priestly, priestly retreats. Mm -hmm. And especially, uh, he knew that the key to the renovation of the church and the salvation of souls was to renew the priesthood. And so, of course, he just really wanted to teach them the, the, the holy hour, of course, and uh, just really keep a pulse to say, as you said, that spirit of Vatican II, he heard that, and he says, no, 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 we're going to do it the right way. Yeah. Um, the Lord first, and uh, again, none of this wishy-washy. So it was good. But the last 10 years of his life, he really spent a lot of time with priests, especially. When I was in graduate school, just about the time I started writing my dissertation, which can be a time where you're very isolated, looking at very obscure issues. Um, a couple of the parishioners gave me uh, two of Archbishop Sheen's retreats to priests. They were in cassettes, because mm -hmm. uh, we still used cassettes in those days. Yeah. And he gave, they gave those to me, and I listened to them over and over, and then somebody else gave me his 50 talks, The Truth Will Set You Free, right. on the basics of the Catholic faith. And that was my spiritual reading. You know, I'd, when I went for a run or something, I would listen to that over and over and over again, all of those. And they, I still would recommend to any seminarian or any priest to listen to those and use them for his own retreat. Yeah. Uh, that would be wonderful. We have, uh, uh, by the way, you can also use that as uh, Christmas presents for your pastor. Uh, we have... Uh, Mary on the line. Mary, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Westwood, Mass. Great. And your question? Well, it's not a question. It's uh, a, a comment, um, if your guest would be good enough to uh, elaborate. on the. Uh, I have never had any, read anybody that could talk about the um, beauty and love of marriage and sex from a celibate priest like... Um, Bishop Shane could do. I think he was absolutely uh, yes. amazing in his insights as to what real love is. And I'm just wondering if he could comment on that. 
Thank you. Oh, great, great topic. So what did Bishop Sheen write on marriage? Yeah, well, I mean, his famous book is Three to Get Married. Right. And I think... Uh, why, I, why three people? Three, <laughs> because it's the man, the woman, and God. There you go. You need God. You need God. Right. And it's funny because um, I love I see, when you see the book used in pre-marriage classes, and uh, it's really good reading. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so much contained in that. But uh, even for the widows out there, I always try to say the book is important because when you lose a spouse, you cling to who's left, and the Lord is always left. So to those at home that are suffering, always know that those, the reason why there's three is because when one leaves, you still grab onto the Lord. But and it, presumably, if you lived your marriage life well, that the one who left really is still with Jesus. Yes. That's, that's important. So all you're doing is waiting for a certain type of reunion because you, as a widow, are focused on Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, this is very important. Uh, the model that uh, of widowhood that our culture offered some years ago was a comedy series, uh, Golden Girls. Mm -hmm. That's not the model. No. No, it, it's our, our Lady and our Lord. That's authentic widowhood. Yeah. We're looking forward to meeting up with a sainted husband or wife. Yes, yeah. The three to get married: the man, the woman, and God. Yep. This is. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that the writings of Bishop Sheen, Archbishop Sheen, are being reprinted. Yes. Um, I think we are. Uh, in, in the 70s, there was a real decline in Catholic publishing. Now we're in a renaissance. There is tremendous amount. I, I give thanks to um, uh, the hard work of people like Father Fessio and Ignatius Press to rev up good Catholic publication mm -hmm. and to have all that material still available and for you to re make it available for us to use in our prayer mm -hmm. and to, to contemplate, to know Christ better yeah. by the insights that he offers. This is crucial. Yeah. I know Sophia Institute Press, the publisher, yes. uh, they've done um, not just this book, but so many others. But, yes. you know, the cries of Jesus from the cross, many people use this book as a Lexio Divina. They just yeah. take, there's 49 meditations in the book. And so uh, many people just read one meditation a day and... Uh, draw themselves closer to our Lord, Our Lady, the Church, through these short meditations. So, uh, again, some people will spend a whole day meditating on one word, or they may read a book, or they just may read it as their coffee table. I like to compare these little essays to Godiva chocolates. Okay. You don't want to have too many at once. Right. One yes. a day, that's, that's yeah. enough. Enjoy that's right. and savor. Yes. Uh, but don't eat the whole box at once. It, it just, right. You'll yeah. miss yeah. The, the richness of it. Yeah. Okay, it's called Cries, The Cries of Jesus from the Cross, a Fulton Sheen anthology. You can get that from EWTNRC.com. If you would pass that crucifix over here, as Bishop Sheen loved the crucifix, I'd like to extend my blessing to all of you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we can make available the programs by Archbishop Sheen, plus do this program only because it's brought to you by you. Keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay all of our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.